These kings were not humans. They were these Anunnaki people. There are people who believe they're the direct descendants of these beings and that they have the right to rule over human beings still to this very day. And they came from the Bureau. They got down to Earth. And this is about 450,000 years ago, according to the tablets. The Anunnaki, who are also the Atlanteans, that's the same people. The Atlantean is a civilization. Anunnaki means those who came from heaven to Earth. Prior to the flood, they put the Ejiji. The Ejiji, according to these tablets, were the working class people. They worked and mined the land and create structures and cities and everything else. But they worked for 200,000 years and they got tired of working, according to the tablets. So we, they were so pissed off. They were so angry. The conditions were harsh. They felt like they were being converted into slaves. And so they had a coup and they decided to go against the kings of Earth. After the flood, they decided to utilize this new tinkered genetically modified version of a Homo sapien sapien. They started this project of capturing hominids and tinkering with their DNA. And they started off with this cloning system at first. So Isis says, I have an idea. She says, I'm going to take an egg from one of the women. And they took the egg and she cleaned out some of the genetic material or whatever they did. They made a zygote. They added some of their essence to the egg. They say essence, I think that's genetic modification in my understanding. They took this zygote, which is what you call in modern science. They put it in her womb. She took it the term 10 months, not nine, 10 months. And then you see her in this famous cylinder scroll holding up this baby saying, my hands have created it. She gave birth to the Adamu, which means first man. And they, so they put Adam in this Eden, E-D-I-N. The guy who ruled over Eden was Satan, the Lord of Eden in the tablets. And that was actually Enlil. And the Bible calls him Yahweh. They think he's God. That guy's just masquerading as God. It was never God. And this Eden was this laboratory where they would have these mating rituals between the different peoples. And they got when they got Adam in there, they tried to mate him with these other ones wasn't working out. So they said, okay, let's take some DNA from him. Let's make another one of him. They made Eve. Then they made it them and bingo, it worked. Crazy story. That was about 200,000 years ago. They also genetically modified us by taking chromosome number two out of our body, fusing it together and putting telomere caps on each end to limit our lifespans. And scientists now, geneticists at universities, they teach this. They say, we don't know how this happened. It's an artificial mutation that would have taken millions of years to happen, but it happened about 200,000 years ago. So the tablets line up with modern science once again. There's been a misconception going around for a very, very long time in the way that people have stated and talked about these Anunnaki beings, which are really the, are, are they, are, they are the Atlanteans, okay? So when you hear Atlanteans and you hear Anunnaki, we're talking about the same people. See, Anunnaki means those that came from heaven to earth or from another place to this planet, from space to this planet. Any being from any planet, anywhere in the known universe that comes to Earth is an Anunnaki. Okay, it's a generalized term. Just like if you were me, right? I live in Florida. I live in a city in Florida, right? So let's say Fort Lauderdale, Florida. If I hopped on a spaceship and went to another planet and people were there and they said, well, where are you from? I'm not going to say I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm going to say I'm an Earthling from Earth. You see? And so it's a generalized name uh, is what it is. Now, Atlantean is a specific name of the type of civilization that they built. They built an Atlantean civilization on this planet. And I personally believe after many decades of research and investigation, reading over a thousand cylinder scrolls, tablets, papyruses, uh, ancient texts and so forth, visiting with ancient sages and wisdom keepers and archeologists all around the world, my personal hypothesis now is that it's not just Earth that was Atlantis. It was also the moon and it extended all the way to Mars and maybe even beyond. They were an interplanetary civilization, not just a ring city in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that sunk. That was just one capital of many capitals that existed on this planet. But they, in fact, were an interplanetary civilization. They had achieved uh what we would hope to achieve in the future but you have to remember according to these ancient tablets they were approximately approximately one million years ahead of us technologically making anything that they do or did or still do to this day appear to be magic when a more advanced civilization meets and engages a less advanced civilization the less advanced civilization will deify the more advanced civilization it's called a cargo cult and what you have here on this planet 
you have humanity, which is one gigantic 8 billion person cargo cult. The text is written by flesh and blood people, except for one text that I know of. There's only one text that's written by one of these beings, and it's the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. The rest of these tablets and scrolls and everything else were authored by scribes, people that one of these entities would dictate to. They called themselves gods, but they weren't gods. They masqueraded as gods, but they themselves even knew that there was something above them because they said the creator of all will answer. They will have to answer to the creator of all for what they've done to people on this planet. So they, they themselves knew that they weren't the creators of the universe because they called several times in the tablets on the creator of all, knowing that there was something higher than them. And so they duped humanity. Uh, some were nice, you know, some were malevolent, some were benevolent. Some were good, some were evil. Yin, there's Yang. Some wanted to help, some didn't want, want to help. Some tried to kill us off, some tried to save us. You can find this in the, all these different epics, Epic of Gilgamesh, Epic of Atra Hasis, the Enuma Elish, and the Seven Tablets of Creation. These texts predate most texts that exist on the planet, with the, except, with the exception of the animal tablets, some of the Vedas, and um, maybe the only thing that will come even close to a written, hand down, handed down text will be the Mahabharata. Right. And so the misconception, let me get back to my point that I was talking about, is this is there's this misconception between people that are following the ancient astronaut theory is that the Anunnaki created humans. Now, we have to be careful on how we state this, because according to the text, they didn't create humans. In other words, they didn't just from scratch out of absolutely nothing. Poof, there's humans here through some type of magic or alchemy or something like that, or they have them or did they have the creation power, they use genetic manipulation, which we're going to take a look at tonight. We're going to take a look into genetic manipulation that was done in ancient times. And this is one of the very first accounts of this evidence of genetic manipulation. But going forward into the future, even into what you call the modern day Bible, you find genetic manipulation when it comes to Mary, the mother of Yeshua, aka Jesus. I don't like calling him Jesus because Jesus means hail Zeus. And I'm not hailing Zeus. I'm talking about a real person, Yeshua, which is his real name, right? Yeshua was also a product of genetic, genetic manipulation through something called vitro and fertilization, as well as his grandmother, who was also a virgin birth, which you never, they never tell you about that in Bible study, that Jesus's grandmother, right? Yeshua's grandmother was a virgin birth. You never hear about it. They never talk to you about that in Bible study. Not once have you ever heard, heard that come out of anybody's mouth, except for me, forbidden knowledge. Look it up. Make sure you get all your apocrypha texts, the text that was by accident on purpose forgotten to be put into the Bible by the Council of Nicaea. That's where you find all the incredible truths at, right? In the book of Enoch, that was he was such an important person that he was spoken about in the Bible. But his book, which talks about these same Anunnaki beings, left out. The Bible talks about the Anunnaki. They call them the Anak in the Old Testament. They say, they say the people that ran into these Anak say that in their eyes, we were grasshoppers in their sight. That's coming from the Bible, the canonized Bible that you take and read and pray to and everything else, right? So these are the Anunnaki, they exist. And these beings, these people that are in these Sumerian tablets, their names are in the Bible as well, but nobody ever reads the Bible, so they wouldn't even know. Elohim is a plural term. Even in the Bible, it's a plural term. They try to pretend like it's a singular term, but Elohim, the Elohim is the same thing as the Naturu of uh, ancient Kem, ancient Kemet. The Naturu, the Elohim, they're the same exact people. The Pantheon of Sumeria, same exact people. Same exact people. I'm talking about a group of, of, of ancient people that had supreme, te supreme tech and supreme knowledge. The Elohim said this, and this is what made it into the Bible. This is in the Enuma Elish, which predates the Bible. The people in the Bible weren't even in their papa's sacks yet, okay? They didn't even exist as a chromosome yet. They didn't even have a chromosome yet. They weren't even thought of yet. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Does that sound familiar to you? Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Isn't that interesting? That you can find this in text that predates the Bible by tens of thousands of years. 
So according to these tablets, this took place some 455,000 years ago. And the, the, but that was when they got here. But the creation of the Adamu took place around 300,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago. And that's when Homo, Homo erectus suddenly changed into Homo sapien, according to modern science. The process by which fashioning of the primitive worker was achieved is then described in the Atrahasis epic, as well as in several other texts. It involved obtaining from the blood of the god his tima. Okay, Tima, that's probably his DNA. Scholars translate as personality or life essence and mixing it with the Ti'it of the Abzu. The term Ti'it has been presumed to come from the Akkadian word Ti'it, which equals clay, which is why it talks about using clay in the Bible. Hence the notion echoed in the Bible that Adam was fashioned from clay, but it's not exactly what it meant. They manipulated that terminology to get you to believe that somebody picked up some dirt and turned it into a human being. I would never want to be considered that I was just turned from dirt into a person. That means I was just a, a lump of mud. Now I'm a person. To me, that's not magical. To me, that's that's just dumb. Anyway, the life essence of personality of these gods was mixed with the essence of the existing being, of the existing being found here on this planet, at the Abzu, which is in Africa. By mixing genes extracted from the blood of a god with the essence of the existing earthly being, the atom was genetically engineered. So the topic of this is, did the Anunnaki create mankind? In a way, yes, but creation from zero to from scratch, no. What they did was our cousins were already here. We had cousins here. According to these tablets, these beings came to this planet. They saw us. They didn't even care. They were like, whatever, let them do what they're doing. We're going to go ahead and start building this breakaway civilization on this planet, mining these resources and building this civilization out. They had their floor plans. They had their street grid. They had everything they wanted to do laid out beforehand. It's all talked about in the tablets. And Lil said, I'm going to create the plan for all time on this planet. They started doing their work. They went right to work. They never touched us, never interact, never messed with us. But in the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis epic, something very interesting happens, which goes back to Mars. These EGG beings, these EGG beings, which were also related to these Anunnaki people, these Atlanteans on Earth, they said, man, we're doing too much work. Like, you got us out here laboring like slaves, and when we ask for breaks, you don't give us any breaks. How long did they work? According to the tablets, they labored for around 250 to 300,000 years, nonstop, generation after generation. They just kept working, 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 building, building, building. No breaks, no real rest, being worked like slaves. Finally, and they read this in the Atra Hasis and also in the Enuma, Enuma Elish, they say, you know what, man, this is getting to be too much. You know, I think they think we're slaves here and, and we're not slaves. So we need to go ahead and get some straightening. So these beings, these EGG people, they got together while on Mars. They had a discussion about it. They said, well, time to go to war. Time to go to war against the gods of Earth. That's Anu, who was the father. And then... Enlil and Ia Enki. That was the Trinity right there. All right, those three people were running the planet. So, what did they do? They got in their ships and they fell from Mars to Earth. They came from Mars to Earth. These are the gods that fell from heaven to Earth in the Bible to go against God, to go against Anu, not the creator of the universe, God, to go against Anu, A N U. They show up in uh, Adam's calendar. In South Africa, which back then was called the Abzu, they go to the location where they are in the middle of the night and they encircle the camp. Read this in the tablets. Read it. They encircle the camp. And then everybody begins to wake up because somebody comes and bang, 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 bang on the door. Like, get up. We here. And like, who's that rabble on my door? What's that rabble on my door? They call it rabble on the door in the tablets. They begin to get up and look around. The guards now are waking up. Everybody's looking around like, oh, man, the EGG are here. 
They don't look too pleased. They don't look too happy. They got weapons. A new and little Anki, they come outside. The war is getting ready to happen. Anki comes up with an idea, says, I have an idea that might fix the problem. There is an existing, keyword, existing being on this planet. They're talking about our cousins. Before we became Homo sapiens sapien, we were already here. Already. But we weren't Homo sapiens sapien. And we weren't monkeys either. We were advanced people. We were smart people. We were just more spiritually in tune with the planet and ourselves. We weren't, uh, you know, we weren't like we are now with disconnected DNA. They disconnected our DNA and all this other good stuff. And so they said, Enki says, uh, in the tablets, he says, we will take our essence and combine it with their essence. And then we will make them into the workers. They will bear the load of the Anunnaki. And that's exactly what started to begin. So they went into this, they came to an agreement, and the Aegis just said, okay, look, if you guys are really going to do this, we won't go to battle right now. We got you outgunned right now, because there's a lot of workers, a lot of us, and not that many of you guys. And if he decide to, we could take you out right now. We're far away from the home planet. There's nothing anybody can do. This is like the wild, wild west out here. We can do whatever the hell we want. So they're like, you know what? We're going to go ahead and... We're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, let you do this. All right. And so now, very good point Kelvin brings up here. And thank you for the donation. The Anunnaki had considered, one of their considerations was artificial people. AI, sound familiar? Artificial beings? Sounds a lot like robotic AI. <clears throat> and the brother said no. We, they had a few of them in the medical place that they had. There's this medical city they established to, to, to help with the workers. But they said that if we have too many, then what will they need us for? What happens when they realize they don't need us? Even they knew back then that robotic AIs, too many of them, was dangerous. So they decided not to do the robotic AI. They decided to start tampering with genetics, organics. So they genetically modified the existing hominid. Now, what they did initially, if you read these tablets, they didn't come to the first successful Homo sapien right away. They didn't even come to a Homo sapien right away. They began to clone these people that were already here, genetically modify them with their DNA and everything, disconnect some of their DNA, get them to be understand their language and be obedient, and they had them starting to do labor. But the problem in the tablets was this. These people couldn't reproduce on their own. It's just like when you take a tiger and a lion, you get a, a you get a, a, a tigon, or a lion and a tiger, you get a tigon. A lion and a tiger that mate can never, they can mate with something, but they're never gonna be able to give birth. They're never gonna get anybody pregnant or be a, or or give birth to anything, right? They're bare, they, they're barren, they can't do it. Same thing was happening with our cousins. They said, damn, this is a slow process. We need, a, we need an army of people now. These EGG, they're going to come back and they're going to be pissed. They're going to destroy us. They're going to destroy us. And Chris Jackson, did the internet kill off the dinosaurs? Yes, they did, because they needed to make way for the workforce and the civilizations that they were building out here on this planet. They talk about using a directed asteroid attack or direct, direct comet strike. <clears throat> so... Um, so this is pretty interesting. So they're like, you know, we got to we got to speed this process up. Isis comes up with an idea. She says, you know what? I'm going to take the egg out of one of these beings. We're going to add our essence to it. I'm going to put that in my womb and carry it to term. So this was the first of the genetic experiment that led to the Homo sapien. There's a famous cylinder scroll at the British Museum with Isis holding up the baby saying, my hands have created it, the first Adamu, which means first man, the Adamu, which means first man. And so she put, the, put this egg in her womb. Now, creating an egg in this way or, or in fertilization in that way is called creating a zygote in modern genetics, or what we call modern genetics today. She created a zygote. She inserted it into her womb. It attached. She went 10 months, according to the tablets, not nine, gave birth to Adamu. After she gave birth to Adamu, once they got it to a mature state, they then had him begin to mate with 
some of these other beings that they had already been tampering with didn't work. Mating didn't work. Mating didn't work. They kept trying to mate, mate, mate. This is in the Eden, E-D-I-N. It clearly states in the tablets it's E-D-I-N, Eden. In the Bible, it's Eden. Isn't that interesting? Eden was a gigantic outdoor laboratory with guards. The same guards that they talk about in the Sumerian tablets, if you read the Bible, they have the same guards at the gates there. And these guards have weapons in the Bible. They got weapons in the Sumerian tablets. You better not try to go in or out. They're keeping you in, and they're keeping the people on the outside out. And then what happens? They say, well, this ain't working. We can't make this guy. It's, it's, he, his sperm, let me check the sperm again. His sperm is working. It's swimming, but it's not working with these other beings. We got to do something else. So they, what they do, they take some of his own DNA. They clone him into, they clone Eve out of him. Then they mate him and Eve. And guess what? Bingo. It worked. She gets pregnant. Oh, now we got the formula. Now we got, we don't have to keep making these damn clones. It's a lot of work. So now Adam and Eve is the first genetically modified homo sapien sapien that can mate with each other and have babies. So they begin to then reproduce that same experiment by taking eggs out of other women, inserting them into wombs of Anunnaki women, having them give birth and give, they call them the Hathors. These are the Hathors. Uh, somebody says, do you know how our cousins got here? Yes, I do. If you talk to the ancient, uh, well, the, the aboriginals, the aboriginals who I met in, in, in um, Australia, according to them, uh, in ancient times, they were seated on this planet by Pleiadians. That is their verbal handed down history for thousands of years. Not just them, also the indigenous natives of, Amer of the North and South Americas. Same exact story. Interesting that this is an abandoned seed planet, that they seeded this planet with people, and then some period of time went by, they were gone. Then these Anunnaki people arrive and say, yeah, these people are just abandoned here. They don't even know what they're doing. They're just trying, trying to learn how to develop themselves from scratch, and they took advantage of it. So back to the story. So they, they now have this mating thing going on. They've been... You, the Hathors have been uh, doing these birthing houses, reproducing the same experiment with Adam and Eve. And now we've got, because you have to have a genetic pool. You can't create, listen to me, people. If you're a grown person right now, if you're a grown up and you still believe that two people can create 8 billion people, because we got 8 billion people on earth right now, there's something wrong with you. I'm not insulting you. I'm just saying you got to re think who you are and how your how high your intelligence level is. I'm, I'm just saying. Because if you go and have sex with your sister right now, you already know that baby going to be retarded. You know this for a fact. It's going to be this, this, a dis disabled baby, disabilities coming out the womb every time. And over time, by the third or fourth generation, it's going to be all kind of malformed disabilities, right? So if we know that for a fact, then what makes you think that Adam and Eve is going to create 8 billion people? Two people are going to create 8 billion. We got to really begin to think here. That's not what happened. The tablets tell you exactly what happened. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. They then created birthing houses where they duplicated the experiment with other Anunnaki women, giving birth more to more and more of these Homo sapiens sapiens, creating a gene pool that they built up so that they can intermingle and inter, inter uh intermate and create babies. When you go into the um into the Bible, Old Testament, you find out that obviously Cain killed Abel, right? Uh, over a dispute because one was jealous that God was having more favor over the other one's uh offering and and so forth and so on. So out of jealousy he killed his brother. Now what happens? God comes back, but who's the God? God is Yahweh. Who is Yahweh in the Bible? And Lil. <laughs> And Lil comes back, according to the ancient tablets, and he's asking, like, hey, what's going on here? Because by then, you know, uh, he, re he realizes that he killed a brother. There's a murder going on, one of the, ver one of the first re recorded murders in biblical history, but not in history itself. Because in the ancient tablets, there's a million murders going on. And he's like, what? why'd you do this? And so forth. So he's telling him what happened. He's ashamed and everything else. He's kicked out of Eden. He's kicked out of the laboratory because this guy's violent now. And he goes, what Cain says something very important in the biblical text. He says, 
The people out there will kill me. The people out there will kill me. What people? There's only supposed to be a couple of people on this planet. What, 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 what people out there? If it's Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, then what people are out there that's going to kill you? There were already hundreds of thousands of people out there living, working, and everything else when Cain was actually born. And then what does God say in the Bible? He says, uh, don't worry, I'm going to put a mark on you, my mark, my brand, I'm going to brand you so that the people out there know you my boy and they won't touch you. That's what the Bible says. That's exactly what the Bible says, right? And so they brand him. He knows that, hey, okay, don't touch this guy. He's a Cain. That's where the Canaanites came from. And so this is what happened with the Cain. With, with, uh, with Cain. So he, he, there were people already out there. God says to him, you, you'll know your wife. You'll meet her. You'll meet this woman. You'll find a woman out there. You guys are going to fall in love, and you're going to build this whole Canaanite kingdom. That's the Bible says. So people were already out there. His wife was already outside of Eden. She existed already. There wasn't two people giving birth to 8 billion people. Stop thinking that. Stop teaching that to your kids, please. I'm begging you. It's foolishness. If you believe that, then start going having sex with your relatives right now. See what happens when you when your baby come out. Just see what happens. It didn't happen that way. Read these tablets. It tells you exactly what happens. These beings were mating. They had creating this mating farm, this mating laboratory called Eden. And, and Lil was known as the Lord. He was known as Satan, the Lord of Eden. Satan, the Lord of Eden. Satan. You want to wonder where that came from? <laughs> yeah, he's Satan. The snake that was in the, in the garden was his brother, Enki. Enki came with the knowledge to, uh, to Adam and Eve and told them that they were, they were stronger and bigger and brighter. And that when he did the genetic tinkering, that he put a little extra in them that one day in the future, they would be able to tap back into it. And they themselves could rise higher than the Anunnaki. And his brother found out about this and started calling him the devil. And that information is in the myth of Adapa. Do I have that book down here? Oh, it's upstairs. The myth of Adapa, which is another incredible ancient text, cuneiform text that's available. The myth, I did a whole thing with Matthew LaCroix on the myth of Adapa. It's so powerful. In the Bible where it's talking about the saying that, you know, the angels were jealous of human beings because they were going to be exalted higher than them, that comes from the myth of Adapa. Ancient text that's talking about human beings, us, being created at a higher level, but not knowing we were than the Anunnaki themselves. We have to tap back into our DNA. We have to tap back into the into our what they're calling junk and plug it back in. We have to tap into our pineal gland and our higher consciousness. We have to tap back into our frequencies. Get back on the frequency uh, mode of love, understanding, empathy, ser service to others. And also then tap into all of our innate gifts that we naturally have. Things that they had to enhance with technology were built into our avatar bodies. Psychic abilities, telekinesis, intuition, all these the extra sensory perceptions that we don't think we even know exist in our bodies, but they're there, just lying dormant, waiting for us to tap back into them. So did the, did the Anunnaki create human beings? Not exactly. They genetically modified our ancestors, which turned us into Homo sapien sapien. And in actuality, all of us are Anunnaki because we all have the DNA of these beings running through our veins today. So every person on this entire planet is an alien. <laughs> You're all hybrids. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see the chat filling up pretty quick here. Uh, everyone's loading on in. Do you think the Anunnaki God's wings were mechanized and arced powered? with the ethereal energy also can they harness cosmic energy good question johnny chan so the wings on the back of the anunnaki that you see depicted carved into stone all over the world literally you can find them in in mexico in ecuador in south america you can find those same carvings in iraq and uh so we know that these beings are global beings they were part of an, a global civilization it, it was a the, the atlantean people 
And they had, when you see them with the wings on their back, a lot of the times you'll also see them with a bird face. The bird face was not their real face because we clearly see them as well with human heads. So we know, or humanoid heads, I should say. They weren't human, but they had humanoid heads. Uh, and so we know that the wings depicted flight, the capability of flight. The, uh, the tablets themselves referenced the fact that they would put these eagles masks on when they would travel into space. So they had the capability of space travel and the eagles mask would be used in one particular tablet. They go to Mars. I'm sorry, not to Mars. I'm sorry. They go to the moon. And on the moon, uh, they had to put their eagles mask on before they stepped out of the ship because the atmosphere was thin. This is this is an ancient tablets. These tablets are like 8000 years old. And they're talking about putting eagles some masks on because the 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 uh, the atmosphere is too thin. This is crazy stuff. But I mean, what better way to convey your message than to put it in stone so it can last through the test of time? And so the wings, though, depicted their ability for flight. Where are the Anunnaki and why haven't they returned? Good question. Part answer to that is some of them never left. When you look into some of the tablets, there was a, a war, that last pyramid war, which you can find evidence of that last war at Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley, where you can see uh, the bodies of people still holding hands dead in the street. And their background radiation is higher than background radiation levels should be. So that means that uh, they were nuked. And the buildings that they lived in are still there, partially standing. But the, 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 brick, the, the mud bricks have been turned into glass. So they've been vitrified. Vitrification typically happens when you hit around 3,000 degree temperature blasts. And so the entire region was vitrified. So was the Giza Plateau. The, one of the biggest reasons for that big, you know, the fact that the Nile doesn't run right up to the pyramids anymore and it's all sand and desert is vitrification. If you put your hand in the sands at Giza, you can begin to pull up balls of glass in certain areas. Which will, uh, which lets you know that there was a war there that extended to that region as well. And all around that region, you we begin to find places where there seems to be some type of weapon signature that has left vitrified uh, building buildings behind, as well as um, you know remnants of ancient cities that look like they were destroyed. And so, uh, during this situation in the tablets, some of these beings said they were going to forego and they were going to leave, and they left, and some of them stayed. So I do believe that in some weird way, they're still around us today because I believe their offspring are still here walking amongst us and you wouldn't be able to detect them or differentiate them from a normal person at this point. And then the other answer is the ones that did go, when will they return? They always claim to, to, you know, to be coming back or we will return. We're coming back at some point in the, in the, in the distant future. For us, it's a, it seems like a long period of time that they've been gone. But for these beings who live for eons, they've only been gone for a little while. It's like they just went around the corner to the corner store and they're coming back. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Now, in the Animal Tablets of Thoth, some of the oldest texts on the earth, 36,000-year-old texts, Thoth the Atlantean says that far in the future, an enemy will come from deep space. And he says that the person that is wise enough to raise his ship from underneath the Sphinx will be able to defeat them with ease. So according to him, far in the future, in some deep future time, there is going to be some type of situation we might face in space. Maybe it's the Anunnaki returning to take claim for this planet. I don't know. That's a good question. Christopher Stevenson, who's older, Enki or Enlil? Please explain the relationship between the two. Thanks, Billy. Enki was older than Enlil, not by much, though. And Enki had a higher ranking number than Enlil, but for whatever reason... The Earth was named after Enki because his name was Ea Enki. Ea is the first two digits of his name in caps. And Enki, Ki, we know that in ancient Sumerian tongue, means Earth. So the Earth, Ea, 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 and Earth, Ki, came together to make the name Earth for the planet. But for some reason, he didn't get kingship over Earth. He took over the head of genetics. I guess maybe he was a better geneticist than wanting to be a leader. But it doesn't really say, there's no tablet that clearly says why Enlil, who had a lower rank than him, ended up superseding him and becoming the leader of the planet. So it's pretty interesting to, to how it happened. Nobody really knows. But Enlil then did that. They're brothers. Enlil and Enki are brothers. And their father is Anu. 
and um, you know, they both had kids. Uh, and uh, Enki's kids, one of them was Nigajita, who's also known as Thoth, Thoth the Atlantean priest king, okay, on the front cover of my book, who wrote the Emerald Tablets. His other son was Marduk, who ended up turning out to be an evil guy, really, really evil, brash guy, uh, also known as Amun Ra to the pre dynastic Egyptians, who tried to usher in monotheism and create a one world religion, which he actually ended up doing. Is the Almic part of the Anunnaki and, and are and also are they the first blacks in America? Good question. So I don't know if they're the first blacks in America, but I do know that according to these tablets, uh, what was going on with Thoth and his brother Amun Ra, aka Marduk, they were having a lot of battles, clashes, hard clashes too. They were fighting, and uh, they were going to war nonstop because. Uh, Thoth wanted to, wanted to help humans and help them rise up to higher levels of consciousness. And Marduk only wanted them to, he wanted to masquerade as a god and have humans praying to him and, and, and waiting on him and serving him and, and, and keeping them dumb. And he would kill them at, from time to time if they made too much noise and all this kind of crazy stuff. So they were clashing nonstop. And so Anki told uh, Thoth, he says, look, let me try to deal with him. You go to the other side. Go go over to the other side of the world and start a civilization over there. So he left and went to Mesoamerica. That's the North and South Americas. But he took Olmecs with him, according to these tablets. He took the Olmecs with him. And he went to Mesoamerica and started to build the Teotihuacan civilization, which spanned from the um, North Americas, the, south, the, the southern part of the North Americas, down in through what we call now Mexico, all the way down and through the Yucatan Peninsula, even down into South America. And so this civilization was built by Thoth and the Olmecs. So they, he took Africans with him, black Africans from, from Africa, which Egypt is in Africa, if you didn't know, <laughs> and brought them to uh, Mesoamerica and began to build these civilizations. The Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas built absolutely nothing. They built nothing. They were barbaric uh, people, just a slight level above caveman. Uh, they stumbled across the area or the regions that had been abandoned by Thoth and the Olmecs for maybe 100 years or so. And they actually moved in and made it their home. That's why you see that these cultures would do things like sacrifice people and rip their heart out and eat the heart. And you say, how can you be so technologically advanced? You can create these advanced structures, but then you're ripping people's hearts out of their chest. The reason why is because they, they didn't create them. And what I'm telling you is not something off my dome. This is actually taught uh, by the people who are ancestors of the Mayans in Mexico. So if you go there and you get a, a good homegrown tour guide, they will tell you exactly what I'm telling you is that the Incas, the Mayans, and the Aztecs inherited what was already there. As a matter of fact, when the Mayans stumbled across the region and the area, they didn't even know what to call the people. They're the ones who gave them the name Teotihuacans. They gave that name to them. Uh, the Aztecs, I think it was almost 150 years later, they had a situation in the area they were living in where a volcano erupted, destroyed the valley where they were living. They went hiking and looking for a brand new place to live. They stumbled across what? Teotihuacan. And, and the Chichen Itza and all of those uh, different areas, uh, Tulum, and they moved in. Uh, and so, you know, they took and they took over and, and it's all about just inheriting what was already there. So much like the dynastic era Egyptians, they inherited what was already there. A lot of that stuff wasn't built yet. Now, they did build some stuff when they came into power, but pre-dynastic when it was Kemet, a lot of the stuff was already there. And um, that's why you see over, the, over time, you see the structures go from super megalithic to smaller, smaller, and smaller, even less quality of building. Even some now are dilapidated and falling apart and have to be fixed because they can't stand the test of time. But the further you go back in time, the more incredible the construction technique, the closer you come towards modern time, the worse the construction technique. And it's very visible and very easy to see that as time went on, knowledge was lost. Okay. Ma Watkins, what is the Nibiru? So Nibiru is actually a planet that orbits a brown dwarf star. So Nibiru is talked about. People said, there's no record of Nibiru in any text anywhere. Oh, you didn't read the text. 
If you get the original version of the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, you'll find that the word Anunnaki is in there. You'll find that the word, the word, the name, or the, the word, the name Anunnaki, the name Ejiji, and also the name Nibiru as a planet that orbits another star. That star is a brown dwarf. That brown dwarf star has the same mass as our sun, but is far smaller and much more dim. Hence, because of the, the name brown dwarf, it's a, it, you can only see it in two mass infrared mode from the Worldwide Telescope. But it orbits our sun about every 4,200 years, according to mainstream astronomers, not according to me. It's in the inner Oort cloud area, which means it's part of our solar system, and it orbits our gigantic sun. And Nibiru is a planet that is on a, it's orbiting a star, a star that's on a crazy elliptical um, orbit around our star. And this orbit takes it, like I said, about 4,200 years. And back during the time of the Sumerians, it had a slightly different orbit. The orbit has changed over time very gradually. It used to orbit every 3,600 years, according to them. They call it a shar. Uh, a sh one shar is 3,600 years. And so these beings would uh, count their lifespan by shars because they'd lived so long. So one shar would be one orbit of Nibiru around our star. And some of these beings were living for, you know, 100 shars, 200 shars. The numbers are just, the, the, the time scales are unconceivable in some cases. But you, if you go and look at the, um, the stone tablet at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, it's uh, the Sumerian Kings list, which I've seen it and got pictures of me standing right next to it. It tells you about kings that ruled ruled for 28,800 years, 14,400 years. I mean, the numbers are just astronomical. That's the time they ruled. That's not how long they lived. Even you find that uh, Thoth, aka okay, Dehudi, Tehudi, Jehudi, whatever you want to call him from Africa, ruled over the land of Kemet for 14,000 years on his own as well. So their lifespans are just absolutely incredible. Lance Benefield, did Enki create humans to be the future of the Anunnaki? Yes, he did. Good question. I can see you kind of almost alluding that you kind of really know the answer, which is great because these people need to know this. So when Enki was genetically modifying the existing hominid DNA, he did something a little extra, which caused him a lot of problem and heartache. He set up our genetic pool and our DNA strand and our RNA to be able to reconnect to higher levels and higher dimensions and one, at a certain point in the future, that human beings could rise above and supersede the levels that the Anunnaki had gotten to themselves, spiritually and technologically. And his brother and Lil found out about this, and they almost went to war over this. They had a, he had a big, big, big problem. He was so distraught and so pissed off that the first chance he got, he decided to try to wipe out the entire civilization of human beings on the planet, hence the Great Flood. Okay, but Enki then again intervened because his half son, who was half human and half Anunnaki, Zazudra, aka Noah in the Bible, he didn't want him to perish. So he gave him a lifeline, told him what's up, and sent him instructions on how to build a, um, a, a ship. Now, this ship wasn't like a ship in the biblical text because we know that that information was just fabricated. Why do we know this? They found the original record the original Sumerian tablets with the order to build the ship. And it was shaped like a round disc. And no, he didn't collect two animals from all over the world. They didn't have two grasshoppers and two roaches and, and you know, two fleas. <laughs> I mean, come on. Didn't happen like that. That's a, that's a fairy tale that they teach you at Bible study. What did happen, though, he was told to collect animals and samples from his local area where he lived and, uh, and store those on the, um, on the ship. And this around this this disc shape, almost like a UFO shaped uh, ship, but built of wood, and um, it's more like a DNA bank, is what it was. It wasn't anything like what you saw on any TV show or movie or cartoon growing up. It wasn't two lions walking up behind two deer and all this other kind of foolishness. They need to stop teaching that garbage to people. That stuff screwed. That's like teaching Santa Claus and everything else. It's foolishness. But that's what happened. So yeah, he, they created human beings to become higher. Higher, higher than the level of the Anunnaki. And the thing that proved this is the, is the incident at, um, at the Tower of Babel when Enlil came back from wherever he went to. He comes back and he see the humans building a tower that rivaled the Anunnaki's tower. And they were putting a Shem on top. A Shem is a rocket ship 
or a rocket top or something that lifts off the top. Whatever that was, it pissed him off. He destroyed the tower. He changed or confused the language. He made people change their languages by force. And he moved people around the different parts of the planet, probably the leaders of the different areas who had helped to collaborate and spread them out so they couldn't communicate anymore. And because he was like, man, y'all getting too powerful. Jacob Green, Billy, do you believe that the pyramids could have been used as weapons by the Anunnaki? Um, I don't think that the pyramids were used as weapons. I believe that the pyramids were a multifunctional stone computers that had several functions. For example, the Great Pyramid at Giza had multiple functions. The first function would be that it was a power generator. It was close to the Nile. The Nile's not there anymore, but back then the Nile ran right up to the pyramid. And we know this for a fact because of geology. And when you look underneath the pyramid, you can see the tubules where the water would flow underneath the, the magnetized uh, crystal granite. When it would flow underneath the magnetized crystal granite, it would create something called physiostatic electricity and positive ions would rise up into the pyramid. And then they would be uh, stepped up going up into the grand gallery with resonating chambers, uh, resonating rods. And then once it got into the king's chamber, it would then be amped up again and shot up through the apex uh, from the capstone, which is missing. And then that would become ambient uh, electricity within the uh, atmosphere that can be picked up by obelisks. So the crystal obelisks were like uh, antenna that would capture this ambient electricity and then transmit it to jet pillars. If you had a jet pillar with you, you can trans you can pick up the energy that's in the atmosphere and you can connect the cable to the jet pillar to a light bulb to a device. They had electroplating back then. We already know this because we found millions of pieces of electroplated gold. We found the fact that they have etched into the stone that they had light bulbs. We know they had light bulbs because when they did these underground crypts and all these tombs with all the painting in these areas where there's no oxygen, except for what comes in through the opening, there's no way to pivot uh, mirrors to get the light to go in there. There's no soot because they didn't burn torches. So we know that they used light bulbs to do this amazing work. So they had technology, they had electricity and the pyramid was that. Also the pyramid was a communications device, the Great Pyramid. The shafts that come out that point at the different star systems are aligned with Aldebaran, Orion, Sirius, and uh, various other star systems. Well, at certain times of alignments, when those shafts are perfectly aligned with those stars, something incredible happens. Water from underneath the pyramid would flow into the queen's chamber, which used to use a version of electrolysis to extract hydrogen from the oxygen from the uh, from the water from the H2O, and it would then beam hydrogen towards those stars why hydrogen because we discovered that the best way to communicate if we're trying to communicate with et is on the hydrogen frequency and so they would piggyback a message on that hydrogen and shoot it towards those star systems kind of giving them an update in my opinion this is my own hypothesis now as to what's going on down here where we are what's what how far we've advanced what we're doing or whatever but i believe that's what it was uh, and, and so, you know, that's just a couple of things, but then also the dimensions of the Great Pyramid gives you so much information about the Earth. You can, based on the dimension of the pyramid, you see that it's 432,000 times the scale of Earth. So if you scaled it up uh, 43,200 times, all of a sudden, you realize that it fits directly inside the sphere of the Earth. It can calculate the distance of the Earth to the moon, the Earth to the sun, the speed of the Earth on its axis, the speed of the Earth around the sun and the speed of the sun around the galactic equator and even the speed of our galaxy amongst the local cluster. That's a lot of calculations built into one, uh, one, one thing, one, one structure. Pretty amazing stuff. Ryan D. Billy, why are the Anunnaki so prevalent in the ancient past, but now nowhere to be seen in the present day? Well, kind of covered that a little bit. They had a big war, and during that war, a lot of them left. This, this earth, this planet became an abandoned seed colony. That's what this earth became. It was a seed colony before the Anunnaki got here that had risen to its own high level of uh, technological advancement. And then something happened, most likely a geological disaster, and that collapsed us. And then we, the Anunnaki came here, which are the Atlantean people, and they took advantage of our down or fallen state. Uh, we were back into caveman stages and then they, or, you know, not, not that we were cavemen, but we were living off the land. We weren't technological at the time that they arrived. They took advantage of that. They took advantage of our ignorance and they masqueraded as gods. Um, so, you know, now in modern times, I mean, to us, they've been gone to us. They've been gone for a long time, but in reality, it's only been a, you know, not, not that much time at all, less than a blink of an eye on geological timescales. 
And so the fact that these beings are still out there, probably still coming by, probably still watching and checking up on us, the ones who decided to stop by and take a look. Oh, look, we used to run this place. Now look at this. Look how they got it going now, you know? And so it's pretty interesting. Uh, the Black Knight satellite could be transmitting updates to them on a consistent basis, telling them how far we've advanced and if we're taking weapons into space. Maybe that's a big concern for them. Maybe if we get to the point where we begin to take weapons into space, then they'll show up and, and we'll have a um, you know somebody to contend with. But we'll see. The so Johnny 374, did the Anunnaki use industrial hemp? Uh, I don't know. if It didn't specifically say hemp, but it does show that they had access to uh, marijuana. And they used to utilize the, um, they used to extract the oil from the marijuana. They didn't smoke it, they extracted the oil from it, the THC and the CBD, and they would mix it with monoatomic gold and colloidal silver to make something called the elixir of life. And they would give it to the heroes of old, or they called them the savants. It would be for healing them, um, for healing wounds and organs and, injuries and uh, and keeping their mind clear and functioning properly and all that kind of good stuff so guadalupe when is the planet nibiru passing through so the planet nibiru is so far away and its orbit is so far away as it orbits its brown dwarf um it's not going to really have any effect on us other than a gravitational wave that gravitational wave is going to create uh warming of ice caps and cores and because it creates friction uh, and which could cause some slippage in, in some tectonic plates, could see some extra earthquakes on its closest approach. But uh, it won't it won't collide with us. It won't collide with the planets in our solar system. It's not going to create a, a, you know, a, a global disaster. Uh, it's not going to end life on the planet Earth, by the way. So just to let you know. Don Solo, Billy, what do you think of Enki, a.k.a. King Yahweh? Is he back? Um, so... Enki is actually not Yahweh. Enlil is actually Yahweh. So there's been a little, a little misconfusion uh, there with uh, who is which. So when you go into the tablets, you discover that Enlil is actually Yahweh. And Enlil was the one that was treating people harshly and evil. And then when he almost got kind of caught doing it, he started blaming the evil acts that he was doing to people, to humans, on his brother. Enki, and then he started to call his brother a serpent and a snake and Satan, the devil, and everything else, because people started calling Yahweh Satan, the Lord of Eden, because he was the Lord of Eden, and uh, he was like, no, I, he's the evil one, him, him. So he was like, he started to try to put the blame on his brother. Cold world is Enki or Enlil Marduk's father? Enki is Marduk's father, and so Enki is responsible for Amun Ra. So if you say amen to at the end of your prayer, you know, they got to thank Enki's off uh, his offspring for for that one. <laughs> OK. Carly Duncan L. Did the Anunnaki use particle colliders and a black hole technology to harvest ether, prima materia, oh, ether and prima materia on Earth? Um, that's a good question. Now, if I were to just answer that question, I couldn't give you any source material for the answer. So. I can only give you my hypothesis, but I can't give you I can't give you any backed up sources, which you guys know I like to bring always. I, I like to always talk with sources. And if I don't have a source, I'll tell you my own hypothesis of something that comes out of my own head. Now, I think that they had a lot of technology. They appeared to have been about a million years older than us or advanced than us, which is a lot of years, because look where human beings came from only 100 years ago. We were in a horse buggy and carriage right? Horse, buggy, and carriage. And now we have the capability of putting probes. And we have a probe now that has already left the outer Oort cloud. It's gone, all right? It's already interstellar space. So we came, we've come a long way. We've got quantum computers now. We've got DNA storage hard drives and all this kind of stuff. Teleportation has been accomplished. We've, we've got a lot of accomplishments we've done in 100 years. Imagine another race of people that are 1 million years ahead. The technology that they can have, that they can that they can wield, would be unimaginable. It would look like magic in our eyes. So, could they have the type of technology? It's very quite possible. Um, I just don't know because I haven't seen any text that can back it up. But I believe when you're that far advanced, that pretty much anything you can think of, they've probably accomplished or close to it. Do Atlanteans currently live under the ocean? Good question because we know that in the Sumerian tablets. Enki made his abode underwater. 
And what's really weird about that one is when you look at a lot of accounts of UFOs, you see a lot of USOs, right? Uh, these are ships that are coming up out of the ocean. And uh, even Christopher Columbus in his captain's log, and captains don't just write stuff in their log. In the U Christopher Columbus captain's log, while they were sailing across the ocean, they saw a UFO come up out of the ocean and take off into the night sky. Now, I've got to remember, back then there were no lights, not even on the boat. The boat only had torches. So imagine for them to write this down and say that something bright as a sun came out of the ocean and took off into the night sky and lit up the sky. So, you know, and there's many, many accounts like that where UFOs are coming out of water. So I believe that there could be still bases there now today. That's my opinion. I was finding that whenever I applied those questions to things that don't quite make sense in the stories you tell from the Bible, it was leading to a completely different storyline that turned out to be the summary form of the Sumerian stories wow. of our ancestors' contact with sky people, or what today we would call aliens yep. or ETs. You know, when you look into the Nag Hammadi and you see information about the Archons, and where they're saying that, for example, one of the Archons resembled this uh, reptilian type being, and then another Archon kind of almost resembles a gray alien, uh, from the description at least, they supposedly in some way they are able to absorb human energy, negative emotions. Oh yes. I think that's the most important insight of the Archon stories. Yeah. The reason it isn't in the mainstream canon is because it contains things that didn't fit the mainstream. So that includes uh, an abduction mm -hmm. narrative, that includes an invasion narrative. It includes a detailed unpacking of Genesis 6, which is a hybridization narrative. And clearly there came a point in the development of Christianity where they thought, this is going to be inconvenient. It wasn't just that they taught us about how to do plumbing or how to build a bit tool. It was things like, ah, makeup, adornment, more interesting clothing. They taught us how to be a civilization. And we were grateful for their input and we celebrated them for a long time. Well, I mean, people today know me as the pay your contact guy. Yes. That's what I write about. Mm. I've written, I think I've written about 15 books, but the four best selling ones are mm. the ones about pay your contact. Mm. That's the theory that in the deep past, our ancestors had contact with other civilizations, with mm. ET visitors. But by rooting into it often surprises people. Mm -hmm. And this is from the world of Christian ministry. Mm. And I was for 33 years in church based ministry. I was an archdeacon mm -hmm. in the Anglican Church. And I was a theological educator. I was training pastors. So this sounds quite different to <laughs> yeah. ET contact and uh, human origins. But it was the theological educator role that actually led me into the world of ET contact mm. because I was teaching pastors the principles of the Kimberly ancient texts. Yeah. And so we do source analysis, form analysis, all the essential linguistic questions of what do the words mean? Mm -hmm. And I was finding that whenever I applied those questions to things that don't quite make sense to the stories you tell from the Bible, it was leading to a completely different storyline mm -hmm. that turned out to be the summary form of the Sumerian stories wow. of our ancestors' contact with sky people. <laughs> or what today we would call aliens or, yep. or ETs. And what I've found, I've been really surprised since publishing Escaping from People, mm -hmm. I've been contacted by so many people mm -hmm. who are in communities of faith, mm -hmm. they're in churches, and either they've had close encounter experiences, mm -hmm. and suddenly they realize they're not allowed to mention that. You have all sorts of other supernatural experiences in a church, but don't mention ETs. Mm -hmm. Or they've seen things in the Bible in the same way I have. And mm. they thought, wait a minute, that's a close encounter. That's a UFO. That, that's yeah. contact. That's colonization. Mm -hmm. And then found in a Bible group with that pastor, oh, you, you don't mention that again if you want to stay in this church. Right. <laughs> and they're totally isolated. And they could be offsided from their entire family mm -hmm. if they start talking about these things. So mm. they reach out to me. And often I hear from people, they may have had a close encounter experience mm. when they were 15 years old, mm. and now they're 65, and they still haven't been able to process it. Yeah. They've never had anyone they could talk to about it. Exactly. They haven't discovered all the communities on YouTube full of experiences, mm -hmm. but they've seen me, and they thought, I, I want to tell that guy. Mm. And so a lot of the time, I'm hearing experiences that are decades old, that mm. people haven't felt the freedom to share. It's a taboo subject, yeah. but our churches, 
are mm, at least half full mm -hmm. of contactees and yeah. experiences who just haven't been able to come out of the closet. That's so true. Because it's such a taboo. You can be excommunicated. You can be ostracized. Right. So it's a tough thing to talk about, especially, you know, in the black and brown communities. It's almost like you dare not even bring anything up about a UFO or an alien. At least when I was growing up, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was like a topic that was really taboo, you know, and um, uh, and hard to talk about. So people go for decades, literally, with this information and this this thing on their consciousness, but they can't seem to find any way to get it out to at least just express it to somebody that would listen without judging them. Exactly. And that can go for generations. Mm. I mean, I often hear from people, uh, guys will talk to me who might be in their 30s. Mm -hmm. They'll say, I've had this experience. They'll describe a close encounter, an abduction experience even, mm. but they'll want help processing it. And I'll say, are you the first person in your family to have had this experience? Mm. Uh, do, have your parents had anything like this happen to them? And they'll say, oh, I don't think so. I think mm. like, well, the dad would have mentioned something like that. <laughs> And then a week later, they'll call me back and say, uh, I mentioned me to my dad, and he said, well, son, since you said that, let me mm -hmm. think what happened to me when I was 15. Mm. And they've kept this story. They haven't shared it because they wanted to protect their kids. Yeah. They didn't want their kids to think they were crazy. Of course. They didn't want anything disturbing to happen to them, so just steer them away from the whole topic. Mm -hmm. But it's actually uh, impoverished the family because yeah. there was information there. Mm -hmm. They could have prepared their kids for these experiences. Yeah. The kid could have had uh, a less isolated, happier life if they'd known, mm -hmm. this happened to dad. Yeah. He's okay. Yeah. We will also buy this. Mm -hmm. And so breaking that taboo within a family can be really awful. Yeah. But the other thing, I'm really excited about my latest book, The Eden Conspiracy, because mm -hmm. it shows that in the Bible, the narrative originally of the Hebrew yeah. switches was one of paleo contact. Mm. It's one that talked about the Tzeba Hashemayim arriving. Mm. And that's the Hebrew for the sky armies. That's right. Turning up. It talks about invasion. It talks about the parceling up of the lands. Mm -hmm. El Elyon gives all the lands to the Elohim. Yep. It's a moment of colonization. And Elohim is plural. Elohim is plural. The powerful one. Yeah. And when you read it that way, the story has made sense. Suddenly it makes sense mm -hmm. why the Yahweh character is trying to get land off the other powerful <laughs> ones because he didn't get any land. Yeah. He got a people group with no land. Mm -hmm. So when he turns up in the story, he has to take his people out of somebody else's land. Until you've got that framework, you don't understand what all the wars are about. Yes. But worse than that, most Bibles translate Elohim as God. Mm -hmm. Singular. Mo singular. Right. Most believers look at El Elyon, they think that's God. They read Yahweh, they think that's God. Mm -hmm. And the story that produces is a total distortion. Yes. Dying of God, a God who goes to war with himself. Yes. Thousands of humans get killed, get slaughtered <laughs> when he gets into conflict with himself. Yeah. He changes his mind. And so there's a genocide in the process. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with this monstrous image of a God. Yeah. And it affects how we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We become these servile little creatures tiptoeing around, desperately afraid we might offend the Almighty, right. make a mistake, fall out of his will, and it is so disempowering. Mm -hmm. You go back to the original meaning of those texts, mm -hmm. the Bible is an empowering document. It's talking about people power. Yeah. It's talking about the power of the human being. And you read those stories realizing our ancestors went to great lengths to get this information to us so we could know what our true power is. Yeah. And then along the way, editors, redactors, let's change how that's told. Yeah. And they turn it into a story that suppresses us and makes us manageable. Right. There's a remix going on. <laughs> In music, they call it a remix, right? <laughs> and so what's, what's really sad about it is it gives us, like you said, this different perspective of what a true all-knowing all-loving god really is which i personally believe exists yes however the, i keep trying to tell people that the one that you're reading about in this book or the ones i say plural yeah. Yeah. those are people that masqueraded as god yes they allow the people to praise them well yes i mean that's half the story and yeah. the other half of the story is that in the sixth century bce these editors sat down and they've got now a word that's understood mm -hmm. to mean God, the source of the cosmos, yeah. and they layer it over the top of other stories. Mm -hmm. So they go back to stories that are really stories of dragons, mm -hmm. of oppression of human beings, yeah. draconian entities, and they put the holy name of God over that text. Mm. 
So even if those awful draconian creatures weren't masquerading as God, yeah. the translators are going to. Gotcha. Absolutely. And yeah. That's where that ends. I mean, I tell you where that ends up. It ends up with human beings justifying invading each other's countries, enslaving other people groups, yeah. all kinds of misogyny and abuse mm -hmm. in the name of God. Yes. Because that's what God does in the Bible. Uh, they don't realize, no, that's not the behavior of God. That yeah. is a violent colonization mm -hmm. that you just claim as something holy. So real. You know, when people challenge me and they say, yeah. this is not Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's just slow down. Yeah. Uh, tell me what you mean by Orthodox Christianity. Because mm. let's go back to the beginning of Christianity. Let's mm -hmm. talk about Origen, mm. the founder, the father of hermeneutics, the principles of Bible interpretation. Yeah. Everyone acknowledges Origen as that. Mm -hmm. Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, he's the guy who came up with the term Old Testament and New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Martyr, you go to those people, they would say what I'm saying yeah. about how to read the, <laughs> the Old Testament stories. Yeah. But unfortunately, some votes went the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Everybody forgets what they said. They were foundational people yeah. and this other mainstream took over. And what people call Orthodox Christianity is the mainstream after those votes. Mm -hmm. but you go back to the beginning and the first Christians, they knew about contact experiences it's there in the New Testament, 1 John 4. Yep. They knew about ancestral spirits. It's there in the Bible, in Hebrews 12. Yeah. They knew about beings washing around in the text that were not God. They yep. talked about the craftsmen mm -hmm. who came and terraformed a devastated planet. Mm -hmm. They knew that wasn't a human entity. No. They knew about the Elohim and the Yahweh stories not being God's story. Mm -hmm. Origen said, if you read those as God's stories, you'll have to believe of God such things you wouldn't believe of the most savage and unjust of men. Mm. He had it absolutely clear. Yes, he did. If we had them in this room, we'd all be singing of the same yeah. show she. Yeah. It's all been forgotten, and Christianity is assumed mm -hmm. to be today's orthodoxy. Right. But in the beginning, it was not. Right. And to add more credence to what uh, Mr. Paul Wallace is saying, if you just simply read the book of Deuteronomy, your eyes will be opened and realize that, wait, this can't be God telling people to kill women and kill children, and it's okay to rape women and, and all. It's just not the creator of the universe. The creator of the universe is not interested in raping a woman right? and, and sending you to a war halfway across your region to people you don't know because one person doesn't worship me properly, so wipe out the entire town and bring the spoils back to me. Why does God need spoils? Exactly. <laughs> and look at what the spoils are. Yeah. Uh, gold, <laughs> beef, lamb, virgin girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you read it closely. That's not for the priests. Right. That is for this entity mm -hmm. called Yahweh. Yes. What does he want with those? And it's the same with all the world's dragon narratives. Mm. Interesting. You're shocked to hear me associate those. But oh. anyone who knows the dragon stories, whether yeah. you're getting them from Wales, mm -hmm. China, Russia, anywhere else, they all follow the same shape. Mm -hmm. There's a time when our ancestors were governed by non-human entities, reptilian entities, who wanted those things, and they enslaved the people, and they would leave the people alone as long as they got all the gold and beef and lamb and virgin girls if they wanted. Mm -hmm. And human beings lived that way for a while until they realized, wait a minute, if we act together, mm -hmm. and if we agree together not to serve this thing, What's it going to do? Can't kill all of us, might kill some of us. Yeah. And they reach a point, and we've seen this in human history, and this happened in the Philippines where the people couldn't be terrorized anymore. Yep. The terror had been used for too long. Yeah. And people reach the point of saying, what are they going to do? They could only kill us. Mm -hmm. And when the people reach that, it pivots into a kind of courage. Yeah. And they come together and they say, no, we're not going to work for you any longer. That's it. That story is in the Bible. Read 1 Samuel 15. Mm. That's when the people come together and they say to Yahweh, no more beef, lamb, gold, virgin girls for you. Mm -hmm. We're going to be led by a human being henceforward. And it was like, um, if I could say the scales falling from my eyes, <laughs> I reread that text yes. after doing the research on Alec Hill and Young, mm -hmm. and I realized this is a dragon story. Yeah. And that name originally mm -hmm. was associated with the dragon story. And yeah. 
actually phonetic clues mm -hmm. in that name, mm -hmm. but it is a dragon narrative. Now, mm -hmm. once you made that switch, mm -hmm. you reread all the stories of the Bible and you recognize there are lessons about people power, the dangers of covert government, mm -hmm. issues of hidden hands and geopolitics. Yeah. It's an incredibly broad education that's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So to someone coming to me saying, look, the Bible's true, stop messing about with it, I would say, yeah, it's full of powerful information. Mm -hmm. And we should stop messing about with it. Let's yeah. remember the root meanings right. of these stories and learn. Yeah. You know, when you look into the Nag Hammadi and you see uh, information about the um, the archons, oh, yeah. right? And where they're saying that, for example, one of the archons resembled this uh, reptilian type being and then another archon kind of almost resembles a gray alien uh, from the description, at least. It's pretty interesting that they they supposedly in some way they are able to absorb human energy, negative emotions. Oh yes, I think that's the most important insight of the Archon stories. Yeah, which the original Christians mm -hmm. talked about. So yeah, the Gnostics they mm -hmm. weren't some add-on or some alternative fringe. They were the original Christians mm -hmm. before Orthodoxy became the mainstream. Yeah, and the thing about an Archon is exactly what you said, Billy. It is an energy-based being mm -hmm. that feeds off the energy of biological life like us. Yeah. And they can influence our thinking and our emotions so that we will go into heavier emotional states, whether that's fear, mm -hmm. anxiety, rage, and then they feed off that. Yeah. And so you would have archons that would manipulate people into going to war mm -hmm. so they could feed off all the misery of that. Yeah. That's in the canonical Bible as well. Mm -hmm. There's a moment where the prophet like high remote views this sky council where all the Elikim are, mm -hmm. and they spend most of their time on that council fomenting war. Yeah. So that those who are energy based can get feed off that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the manipulation of fear is all part of that story. Yeah. And there's a, an entity there that we could call an archon that tricks one nation mm. into going to war against another on false intelligence. Wow. Sounds Just, familiar. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it can feed off all the negative energy. Yeah. And uh, these are great stories. I have to believe them that there are entities like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even if you take them figuratively, yeah. there's powerful information in that message. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, algorithms behave exactly the same way that archons do. That's right. Hey, Bim just got riled by mm -hmm. that post. Let's yeah. send in 10 more. Let's yeah. send more really riled. Then yeah. they start engaging. Yeah. And, same uh, thing happens. Yeah. We can we can monetize this rage that yep. they are feeling, and I think if you understand how algorithms work, that's a real insight into how our codes work. Mm -hmm. And I happen to believe we are surrounded in a soup of company, mm -hmm. some of whom uh, predate off us in that way. Mm -hmm. And the message, the take kind of messages, you've got to be very intentional about your emotional state. Yeah, if you are beginning to be pulled into a fog, you want to recognize that and check that quickly. Mm -hmm. If you're beginning to live angry from morning to morning, yeah. <laughs> recognize that, you want to check that. Mm -hmm. You control your emotional state. Yeah. Don't be manipulated. I mean, if I lived um, if I lived in Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. I wouldn't watch the TV. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, on a daily it's basis, uh, I'm, I'm seeing adverts for sickness yeah. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. All these adverts say, you know, is your water killing you? Yeah. Uh, you might not be sick then at all. <laughs> you can be sick in a minute. And then all the side effects roll underneath yeah, the... Yeah, so I'm going to be in a perpetual state of anxiety. Yeah. And I don't want to go out today. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be very intentional about your intake. Yeah. And just recognize the signs when you're going into not a good emotional state. Mm -hmm. And check it. Do something to get yourself in a better head space. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're going to spiral in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. It won't be benefiting you. No. It'll be benefiting something else. That's so true. When you started looking into the scripture, how did it then lead you to ancient texts and tablets? It was the root meaning as, as, as the key words. It was going to words like Elohim, mm -hmm. Elion, El Shaddai, Yahweh. Those are all the words that get translated as God, but it means the powerful ones, the powerful one more powerful than the other powerful ones, mm. and the powerful one, the destroyer, yeah. and then this name that mm. is a really draconian name. Mm. And then from there, I looked at other words that hint at ancient technology. So you've got Nuluach, mm -hmm. you've got the Kabod, 
Uh, you've got the Burim and the Thummim. And what's interesting is the technology is being described by people who don't know what it is, mm. but they describe it so faithfully. Yes. You and I can read those texts and say, yeah. That is a drone. Mm -hmm. That is something like a Saturn V. I don't know what they're using. That that's a wormhole. Yeah. Uh, we recognize the phenomena, or we read weapons. There's the um, Kedi Mathasal or the Kedi Mashital, the Yod of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. One it, you translate it of uh, the root beings, you get to the shattering thing, the disintegrating mm -hmm. thing. Mm. Apparently, six individuals with the disintegrating thing can ethnically cleanse an entire district. <sighs> Wow. Our ancestors would have read that and thought you can't eat out of a sword. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't even do that with a gun. Mm -hmm. We can read that and picture the kind of technology that's being referenced there. That's yeah. Yahweh's technology, mm -hmm. in case anyone is thinking. That's right. right. <laughs> and uh, he wanted those people ethnically cleansed yeah. purely because they remembered he was one of many. That's right. And he wanted all the carvings of the sky armies that say the Hashalayim destroy it. Anyone who wouldn't go and show public grief that those carvings existed, mm -hmm. get rid of them. Get rid of them. People read that, they find it hard to imagine, mm -hmm. but I would just say to them, there are countries mentioning no names in the world today that if you don't go into the public square and show open grief because your great leader is sick or has mm -hmm. died, you run the risk of your whole family being executed. That's, that's this world in the present. Right now, 2023. That's the kind of leader Yahweh was mm -hmm. in the book of Ezekiel. So all these narratives are there that when you are a preacher, and when you translate those as God texts, mm -hmm. you have to tiptoe around them. You know they're, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was as a preacher, I always put that into the, I've got to get back to that basket. Yeah. And I went back to these anomalies. I did the translation. Mm -hmm. And you only have to do the translation work for a couple of days before you realize you are in the Kadeiform texts of ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. Yep. Those are the sources of all the biblical stories of the early in. Yeah. And as soon as you start reading those, mm -hmm. the whole other world opens up. You can't go back and read the Bible in the old way. No. So it was a by degrees change for me. Yeah. I've known there were these problems for a long time. I suspected there were ETs in the Bible for yeah. a long time. But once I did the translation work, I thought, okay, this is actually a totally new direction of mm -hmm. my work in for the whole foreseeable future. But yeah. it changes so much of how we live our lives. You mm -hmm. know, we think about ourselves. It's not just different religious ideas. Yeah. It it changes your life. Completely changed. And it's I mean, the translations I use mm -hmm. are the most broadly accepted translations of the Kidaeform text. Mm -hmm. That's not me making translations up right. back to mm -hmm. a narrative. Right. These are translations that were made in the 18th century. 18th, yes, right. <laughs> and the the narratives of ETs were there from that time to yeah. this. Yeah. And it's just a matter of now saying, let's stick to the implications of this. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting? Um, Edoch is spoken of, of, of high, on high accord in the Bible, but his book is not in the Bible, right? Ah, well, it depends which Bible. Yeah, well, the Ethiopian Bible, I think yeah. it's in that Bible. Yeah. That's right. Most Bibles omitted the book of Enoch. Yeah. And I was trying to find out why was that. And the only thing I could find was, I know that in one section in, in the book of Enoch, he talks about these beings coming down to earth and teaching mankind how to make weapons and teaching them how to uh, make jewelry and perfume and all this kind of stuff. I think that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be <laughs> And it, it's, it's a scandal in a way that it isn't in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So... Kudos to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church because they have kept it in the Bible from yeah. the beginning until the present day. Mm -hmm. But I think that it should be because the writer of Jude in the New Testament assumes all his readers have read the book. Mm. And when he quotes the biblical Enoch mm -hmm. from the book of Genesis, he quotes the book of Enoch word for word. Mm. So anyone who takes the New Testament seriously mm -hmm. should be reading the book of Enoch. And I'm pretty sure you're right. The reason it isn't in the mainstream canon is because it contains things that didn't fit the mainstream. Right. 
So that includes uh, an abduction mm -hmm. narrative. Right. That includes an invasion narrative. Mm -hmm. It includes a detailed unpacking of Genesis 6, which is a hybridization narrative. Yes. And clearly there came a point in the development of Christianity where they thought, this is going to be inconvenient. What we really want here is a religion that's pyramid shaped, mm -hmm. you know, with the emperor and yeah. God at the top, mm -hmm. and then the people at the bottom paying, praying, and yeah. praying. Yeah. The idea that actually the universe is more complicated, and they all might be having contact experiences, mm -hmm. and they might be getting accurate information from somebody other than their bishop yeah. or the emperor. Mm -hmm. uh, can't be dealing with that. Yeah. One news agency only. Yep. Can, can one source of information? We don't want contact as part of the faith, even right. though it's there in the Bible, yeah. 1 John 4. Right. And I think the themes of visitation, hybridization, and what I find really exciting, mm -hmm. all of those, yeah. is the story of humanity's great leap forward. Mm. It says that we went from being uh, creatures that lived in animal subsistence on the planet's surface mm -hmm. to civilization builders. Yeah because of non-human entities who came from outer space and taught us how to do these mm -hmm. things. And I love that the Book of Enoch mm -hmm. unpacks that enough to say it wasn't just that they taught us about how to do plumbing yeah. <laughs> or how to build a bit tall. Right. It was things like, ah, mm -hmm. makeup, yeah. adornments, yeah. Right. Uh, more interesting clothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they taught us how to be a civilization, and we were grateful for their input, and we celebrated them for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in the Eden conspiracy, I mm -hmm. point out, you go to the prophet Jeremiah, mm -hmm. he tells you openly, there was a time where you could go to every high hill, yeah. and under every green tree, and you'd find an installation saying, thank you to Asherah. Wow who came from outer space, right. from the Pleiades, to teach our ancestors how to become a civilization. Mm -hmm. And that's primitive Judaism, yeah. a remembrance of that great leap forward and all those who came that helped us. And then you get Jeremiah here, second kings, and the king comes along and he says, I want to obliterate every memory of that. Yeah. I'm going to destroy the carvings. Yeah. I'm going to knock down the temples. Mm -hmm. We're going to illegalize the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. We're going to disband the priesthoods. I'm going to turn this into a religion. One God, mm -hmm. Yahweh, the violent one. Yeah. Because then you can justify anything. In exactly. Religion. One God, one king, mm -hmm. one temple in Jerusalem. All the ties of the whole nation can come to Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. To the high priestly family there. Yeah. Forget all the other priesthoods. Right. <laughs> Forget all the other temples. Yeah. That the kings, the Jewish kings have set up. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't know that Primitive Judaism was a celebration of paying a call attack. Mm -hmm. And then you get Jeremiah, two kings, and the narrative is yeah. changed so that everyone will forget. Exactly. Except changed by there. force. Still there. Yeah. Still right. Still there. And, you know, one of the biggest things that's always missed with these sacrifices, they wanted to have some nice fresh meat and vegetables. Because those sacrifices is how they ate their food. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. And in fact, there's, a, there's another book that doesn't make it into Western Bible, uh -huh. Bell of the Dragon. Yep. And it's quite an important book mm. because it clarifies that the food sacrifices were not for the priests. Mm -hmm. The food sacrifices are portion were to the priests, and then a specified portion goes to the Elohim, uh -huh. including Yahweh, mm -hmm. for them to eat. Exactly. At a specified number of the virgins to the Elohim, including Yahweh, for them to do whatever they want. Yeah. And join the dots. That's not a transcendent God. That's no. not the source of the cosmos. No. Needing all that stuff. Yeah. You see, like I always tell you, not the creator of the universe. We're talking about people. Yeah. They're just people. They're with more advanced knowledge, but still people, hominids of some type. Hominids. Some hominids and yeah. some reptilians. Reptilians. As well. Yes, exactly. Which is interesting because when I study the Ubaid culture out of that region, I have some of the remakes or, or the, um, the um, I guess, the uh, scale models of some of the artifacts of the Ubaid culture, those reptilians. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, there's so many of them they found. Some had staff, some had loins, some were naked. So I'm thinking those probably were the working class, the naked ones. Yes. Um, so some are a, one, a woman is breastfeeding a baby, but they have the reptilian head, the scales, 
And yeah. they found some of the structural remnants of their ancient structure still there. So this was a real culture that existed and lived on this planet. Yes. And, you know, I love to hear the mainstream academic explanations yeah. of these things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're hilarious. <laughs> yeah, they're hilarious. Oh, they're really <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's just the inconsistency. Yeah. You point to one carving, well, that shows mm. what the people saw. Yeah. This obviously is completely made up. Right. <laughs> No, that's a fabrication. Get to that. Yeah, they wanted to make an entire, uh, mo uh, you know, mockery of a potential civilization that will never probably. No, they just yeah. what they created with these statuettes was what they actually encountered. Exactly. And I believe those statuettes might even been, have been created by the Ube culture themselves. Yes, I think that's very possible. Yeah. From what I've seen, I think you're on the right track. There. Yeah. And of course, the academics do the same with representations of ancient technology. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Mesoamerica yeah. and you find all these carvings representing what looks like space helmets, right. what looks like what we would call a Bluetooth mm -hmm. microphone earpiece, if you ask the guides in the museum, why did they carve that? Yeah. The answer is, well, those are symbols that imply advancement, mm -hmm. higher intelligence. Mm. And so the kings, the, the priestly kings and queens, you know, wear these so they look like an advanced being. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm. Is that what the advanced beings wore then? Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean it literally. Uh. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Why does something like a Bluetooth represent advancement? Why yeah. is something like breathing apparatus or mm -hmm. about something like a helmet, a space yeah. helmet, something like a space shuttle? Mm -hmm. Why did they pick those symbols yeah. to indicate advancement? You, you just go the extra step with your question mm -hmm. and you will have stumped. Yeah. Oh, there, you can see the steam coming out of their ears. Yeah, that's right. What we're talking about, sir, ma'am, is a cargo cult. Exactly. We're talking about a, a more advanced society that engaged a less advanced society and that less advanced society deified them and now are trying to mimic them exactly. by any means necessary, just like they did oh. in the atolls in the French Polynesia. I love that you said by any means necessary. Yeah. Because the clue for me that it is a cargo cult we're looking at. If you look at the Jaguar dynasty, for instance, mm -hmm. and one of people and these depictions I was just mentioning, you will have, say, Queen Shook Freaks. Mm -hmm. She'll be wearing that Bluetooth, mm -hmm. but it's not working because mm -hmm. uh, they don't know how to make it work. They, yeah. they put something together that looks like what the advanced beings wore, mm -hmm. but it's not achieving remote communication. Yeah. And you know that because she's simultaneously doing a bloodletting. Mm. She evoke an altered state of consciousness mm. even so that she can have a contact experience. Yeah. Now, I don't know about your blue teeth. <laughs> I don't have to do a blood No, we are not doing any bloodletting. It's a little clue that they, they are copying technology they've seen, mm -hmm. that they don't know how to replicate, mm. and they know that the goal is remote communication. Yeah. And uh, so I think, yeah, so that you're... Yeah, I think. I think we can kind of see this across the board, all around the United, all around the world. Forget the United States, all around the world. You look into the Americas, for example, in the Mayan culture, you see that they inherit these super advanced civilizations. However, they're still uh, pulling people's hearts out of their chest. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's right. Pe yeah, it's funny. People often say to me, "Hold on, you're saying the Mayans had all this advanced information about the birds beings. How come they were so brutal?" Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to there was a time when we were governed brutally. Mm -hmm. Just because these beings had better tech than us, didn't make them better than us. It just meant they could govern over us. Yeah. And sometimes they did it with brutality. And mm -hmm. we, we just copied what we saw. That's it. And this is how we may tell in power over others. Mm -hmm. So you've got stories in the Bible of Elohim who as they can get a human being to sacrifice their child. Mm -hmm. Well, now they know they've got total control. Yeah. And I think human leaders have copied that technique from that time to this. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can go back to at times in my history. Yeah. And that's what the human leaders did. Right. That exactly. That was it. And yeah. Terrorization. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to go to this yeah. is a very dark yeah, strategy here. But there has always been an aspect of the higher ups terrorizing oh, yeah. ordinary people. And benefiting from their terror in various ways. Listen, if you go back and look at the Sumerian version of Yahweh, which is Enlil, in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? So the Epic of Gilgamesh is the true and full story of Noah's Ark, it's the Zudra and, and, and Gilgamesh and, and his created uh, friend that went along with him on this hero's journey, and he's looking for Zia Zudra. But long story short, in there, Enlil begins to get angry 
because the human beings are making a little bit too much noise. This is Yahweh, by the way. Kill them off. Here's the first occurrence of chemtrails. He literally says, spray their fields, dry out the crops, starve them to death. You know, so we're talking about uh, a being who's being looked upon as a god yeah. who, whenever he gets good and ready, decides, oh, just call these humans off. Just, just re remove. There's just too many, just too much noise. Oh, they're always hungry. They're always clamoring about, he goes. Just kill some more. So you see this brutal, what you're talking about, this yeah. brutal way of ruling over them, showing them that their life was completely worthless and meaningless to them. Yeah. And they yeah. would just kill them off whenever they wanted to. Exactly. So he's he's there saying there are too many of them, they're too noisy. Call them, yeah. for God's sake. Yeah. And so he does that spray. Mm -hmm. There's a spray story in the Mayan tradition as well. Oh, wow. Where the progenitors, as they're mm. called, who are reptilians, mm. feathered serpents, they again say these human beings are just too much. They're too difficult to manage. They're actually too intelligent. Mm. We didn't leave them this cloud. And so they go back to the chief genetic engine, which is Kukuvats, yeah. so called or Kuku Khan. Mm -hmm. Can you dumb them down? Mm -hmm. And he comes up with a vapor. And mm -hmm. when sprayed over human populations, mm -hmm. the brain damages them. Wow. So that they're limited to the immediate uh, surroundings, their five physical senses. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, they'll have to rely on an authority to tell them what's going on. Mm -hmm. We can work with that, they said. Yeah. So, I mean, goodness me, the, the, the brutality of brain damaging a whole population so you can manage them is a very, very similar ethic. Mm -hmm. And you talk about Enlil being the Ape character. He is sometimes yes. in some of the yeah. Ape narratives, and it's often in the last year narrative. Yeah. So it's there in the flood narrative mm -hmm. as well. It's Enlil, he says, we'll kill them all with a flood. Mm -hmm. And then Enki, he is closer to the human beings because yeah. he's in charge of Project Earth. And he wants to rescue Project Humanity. Mm -hmm. And so he comes up with the rescue plan of the Alan as you see in the road. No, right. Uh, yeah. After Harsis. Yeah. And that's how the story goes. So you've got um, the younger brother, Enlil, he's awful. And then Enki does a rescue job. Yeah. But what happens in the Bible is worse. Mm -hmm. Because Yahweh is Enlil and Enki. Right. They combine some of the, the, yeah. the two attributes together. So he's actually double minded. Yes. So he makes the humans and then changes his mind. Right. He's sorry for what he did. <laughs> what? <laughs> and you created this insane monster. And yeah. then, if you want to stay in the mainstream of uh -huh. Christianity, you have to justify it. Yeah. You have to justify it. I'm saying, well, that's fine. Yeah, don't don't that's question not, don't question not, God. Don't question God. That's don't right. question God. And so there we are. Yeah. You you really have to suppress your entire conscience. Yeah. To take that as a God story. I did a video recently on the Paul Wallace channel with the title of "Did Jesus Worship Yahweh?" Mm. It got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. I pointed out in that video that if you want to read those stories as God stories, mm -hmm. the only way you can do it yeah. is to start justifying. Awful thing. Wrong. Start justifying genocide. And I had a whole heap of people coming on and saying, yeah. there's nothing wrong with genocide if God found oh, it. I, I, I had the same thing. For my point. I did a video called, could the God of the Bible be Satan? Yeah, so it's the same message. Same, same message. I think it's in a million, two million views or something. But yeah, same thing. A lot of the comments were like, people were going, you know, no, this is what God, this is how it was back in the day and it was okay. And I'm like, yeah. No, it's not okay. No, it's not okay. Not okay. And this is why, you see, Christians are entrained to believe there's continuity between the, the yeah. stories of the Elohim, stories of Yahweh, you can what Jesus is all about. Mm -hmm. And it's not continuity. No. Jesus came to set people free. Yeah. And he sets people free from Yahwism, mm -hmm. which is why when you get to Acts 15, the apostles are all saying Christianity is not built on Yahwism. To get faith in those laws, or belief in those stories, Christianity is going to be built on something else. It's, the only way they can come to that decision mm -hmm. was because Jesus put clear blue water between his idea of God, the source of the cosmos, yeah. and these awful, violent stories of beings who came and stole and killed and destroyed. Yeah. These awful stories of the father of lies and the one who was the murderer from the beginning. He's not talking about the source of the cosmos. Yeah. And he called Theos, father, daddy. Yeah. He's talking about the Elohim and Yahweh stories. And right. People like them. Exactly. I think there's a wonderful definition of God that I find in the New Testament, mm. the Apostle Paul, because he's talking to a non-religious audience one time, and he says, 
by God I mean, or by Theos mm -hmm. I mean, the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, mm -hmm. of which we are all offspring, as one of your own poets has said. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that definition, there's no anxiety. No. There's no separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's not you are separated from God until yeah. you had to claw your way back into the <laughs> No, but you are an emanation of God. You're an expression of God. Your thoughts are an mm -hmm. expression of divine intelligence. Your consciousness, an emanation of source consciousness. You couldn't be closer to God than you are. It's something to learn, mm -hmm. to enjoy, and... Actualize, mm -hmm. and I find that such an empowering vision, and we have detracted from it by yeah. fell to our religious tradition. Yeah. Get back to the root meanings, and it all becomes crystal clear. In that area, that I started coming across a hidden story, a story that had gone untranslated, sitting in the pages of the Bible itself. And when I went to the root meanings of the key words, I realized that the ancient Mesopotamian stories from ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria are buried in the texts of the Bible. And where they overlap, those correlations can be found in other ancestral narratives all around the world. And it really was through the work of Bible translation that I found those connections. And then when you read these narratives alongside each other, the ET aspect of the Anunnaki stories becomes very, very clear. And again, moving on from there and finding the same themes and motifs in Mayan story, African story, Norse story, Vedic stories, Greek stories. When you put them alongside each other, that's when the ET aspect becomes unmistakable. And you realize that we're being given information, not just about long lost cultures from Mesopotamia, but information about humanity and our place on the planet and our history in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And find that actually we are tapping the wisdom of the ages from all around the planet. It's very hard to talk to anyone that comes out of the church about the Anunnaki, the Anuna, uh, you know, in these these beings of old, uh, as potentially being from other planets or other dimensions, what are your thoughts specifically on that information, Paul? I, for me, it was uh, life changing finding that information because I hadn't seen the connection with the cosmos, uh, with other worlds, other civilizations until I saw the connections between the Bible, which was home base for me, and the stories of the Anunnaki. And it really was through the work of Bible translation that I found those connections. And then when you read these narratives alongside each other, the ET aspect of the Anunnaki stories becomes very, very clear. Mm -hmm. And again, moving on from there, and finding the same themes and motifs in Mayan story, African story, Norse story, Vedic stories, Greek stories. When you put them alongside each other, that's when the ET aspect becomes unmistakable. Now, there are scholars who look at the Anunnaki stories and they don't see them necessarily as ET narratives. Mm -hmm. um, they might interpret them another way, but I think that's only possible when you read them in a bubble. Mm -hmm. And the thing that has happened for me is learning to read the Bible, not in a bubble, and the Anunnaki right. narratives, not in a bubble. When you read them alongside each other, the technological aspects suddenly become really stark. The interstellar aspects become really stark and become completely unmissable. And you realize that we're being given information, not just about long lost cultures from Mesopotamia, but information about humanity and our place on the planet and our history in the cosmos. So it really is um, paradigm shifting in that way. And I found that when your story of human origins shifts, which it has to as you make that journey, so your understanding of who we are today changes, your understanding of what our potential is changes. And you realize these stories are not just about the past, they're about equipping us for a better, more powerful, more fulfilling human experience in the present. Exactly. That's the purpose and the reason why I dig so deep into this ancient information. 
because I believe the past is prologue. And it will give us the, the concept and idea and the knowledge and the changes that we need to make to create a much better future for ourselves and live up to our true potential, which is yes. infinite, right? Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. I'll say something that it will sound like a non sequitur to a lot of people. If anyone has ever wondered, how is Billy into this and he's into cryptocurrency, the things are absolutely connected. Because once you reframe these stories, you realize there's information about politics, economics, money that you've missed in the stories because you've been reading them in a religious way or a purely historical way. But again, once you put these stories alongside each other, you see the themes overlapping mm -hmm. and you realize there's information about money right there and the kind of relationship we should have with it and what it means to be more empowered and not dependent on people controlling the value of everything that you're earning. So mm -hmm. it was one of the things that amazed me when I first followed this white rabbit into paleo contact to realize these topics do all connect. And my great challenge, in fact, with writing Escaping from Eden, the first book in the Eden series, was how do I stop this being a book about everything? Uh, how do I keep my focus and just allow the reader to make this journey in, in a more linear fashion? Because these things really are connected. And I think if they didn't connect, if there wasn't a therefore I can do this or therefore I can do this differently, it would be far less interesting. Back uh, in my time in ministry, if I was uh, researching to bring teaching to a community, I would sit down with certain tools, certain books that would help me unlock the texts. So I would have an interlinear, I would have a lexicon, uh, I would have these dictionaries and resources, I would have concordances, and that's what would enable me to research and produce, you know, a fantastic teaching series. But when I'd been in the ministry for longer, I realized it was far more valuable to show my people all those resources and say, you can get these too. Yeah. You can use these same tools to get into the texts, to get out of them what all the richness that's there and not just have to be dependent on a preacher or a writer or a priest to tell you what's what. And I don't know about you, Billy, but for me, it really took some months and some years to fully get my head around the shifts being implied by the data. And so yes. it's how do we make that journey? How do we keep our sense of um, integrity, our sense of security, while all our beliefs seem to be doing this? One thing I think people need to understand about the teaching styles that we have is we're not supremacists. OK, no. And what I mean by that is uh, we are not black power, white power, yellow power, red power, green power. We are about human power. And exactly. as far as I can tell from Paul's teachings and from my teachings, I have seen uh, the incorporation of every race, creed and color on this planet into these teachings and studies and podcasts and networks and everything else and TV shows where you name it, we, where we've been in our books. This isn't about supremacy. I think the supremacy yeah. mindset, it hinders mankind. It keeps us from growing. It keeps us from developing. It keeps us, keeps us from reaching our true potential whenever we think that we are better than this one and this one's better than that one. And I think that's all a part of that huge divide and conquer tactic that started way, way back, eons and eons ago. And we can still see from a comment like that, the effects of it still to this very day, a lot of people are just, you know, because of the things that have happened to us in the past, still yearning and grasping and reaching to say, hey, claim us. This is our thing, too. Well, that's yeah. what we're doing. For me, it's actually the international scope of these stories that really excites me mm -hmm. and find that actually we are tapping the wisdom of the ages from all yeah. around the planet. And yeah. I think when you do that, it unravels a lot of the... A supremacist kind of thinking or binary kind of thinking where I think religious texts have often trained people to think in terms of us and them. Mm. And it's been deeply, deeply unhelpful. Yeah. But I find the text you and I probe 
give us a far more layered view of the world. So if you go, for instance, into the Mesopotamian stories, you look at the texts from ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria, they're not religious texts. They're not stories of good versus evil or goodies and baddies. There's a whole spectrum of beings with a whole spectrum of agendas. Mm -hmm. And when you start um, seeing the world through that kind of a lens, you've got a far more subtle, nuanced way of understanding things. And I think we need that today. I think if we approach the world, our own communities, or the world of international politics in a binary way, well, who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad, you're never going to achieve understanding, let alone world peace, if you approach things that way. You've got to realize there's a spectrum of people and a spectrum of agendas, a spectrum of nations, a spectrum of agendas, and it's about who are we best aligned with and where do we find our agreement? And I love that that international vision that comes from these ancient texts really equips us for understanding the present in a far more sophisticated and empowered way. We have to understand, like, <laughs> what is the color of consciousness? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, I think that people get so caught up in these meat suits that we're inhabiting that they forget that we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. And this is a temporal thing, temporal in time. And this is temporary. Our true higher selves are in a whole nother dimension. Uh, you know, and so it's really interesting when I when I read books like The Myth of Adapa, right? And I'm able to get information from this ancient uh, Mesopotamian text where I'm finding out that the human avatar is set up to be one of the most complex and intricate structures in the universe, and that the Anunnaki say this themselves, that the Adapa, which is the first man, was created to be perfect, and that all the knowledge of the universe is in his body. And we haven't even tapped into that yet, right? It's set up in a way that over time, we would be able to learn how to access this incredible knowledge and wisdom and that uh, consciously we would continue to ascend. And they said that we can even become higher than them. When I see a statement like that in the myth of Adapa that says they were created higher than us, that sounds a lot like a biblical text that I've read before, where the angels were saying that the humans were created higher than them, and some of them got angry about that. Yes, it's so interesting, the correlations, because that explanation of the the beauty of the human form and the whole mystery of the cosmos being secreted in the human form you can find that in jesus's teaching yeah. when he says uh, the kingdom of heaven is within you mm -hmm. you go to the root meaning of those words kingdom that's realm heaven that's the skies the universe so the whole cosmic realm is within us so if we mm. look deep within ourselves we'll find the cosmos You'll find that in Egyptian and Greek thought, of course. You go into Hermeticism, and the idea is there that when you study the very close, you'll be understanding the very distant. When you study the very small, you'll be understanding the big picture. And so you've, we just named three cultures there, offering mm -hmm. the same phenomenal insight, using right. different language, different imagery, but it's the same truth. Facts, absolute facts. So I think a couple of things happen. If you're coming uh, from a place where you've got a really defined world view, I mean, you might be an atheist and you, you've got some very strong control beliefs, or you might be coming from a religious start point, you've got some strong control beliefs. You are going to find data that's going to bump up against your pre-existing conclusions. But there are a couple of things, a couple of ways in which you can be impacted by that. And the first is that in order to be a researcher, you have to be comfortable with not knowing. And I know from my background in Christianity that there are certain beliefs and expectations that make a lot of believers very uncomfortable with not knowing. So if you come, for instance, from... A, a confessional church 
where your faith is based on a doctrinal statement, your faith is built on knowing certain things, isn't it? And so you have to first identify that and realize, okay, to research certain things, I am going to have to part that over here. And unless I can do that, I don't have the freedom to explore. If my sense of security in the cosmos is connected with knowing what I believe about everything, I might as well stop right now. So you have to identify things that could be a problem, that could be breaks, and then know how to park them. Another aspect, I came from evangelical Christianity, where hell is taught as a doctrine. So that's hell for the non-believer. So that's all tied in with beliefs and conclusions. And I was very fortunate when I went through theological college that I had the time and the opportunity to really critique that doctrine and find that it's not built on solid foundations in terms of the Bible. And so I was able to put that doctrine in a box and realize that's not necessarily the right explanation of what Jesus was on about. And until you can do that, you have a pressure on you to have your doctrine buttoned down. And so when you go to a text, you are trying to correlate it to things you already believe. Mm. So it's almost like you've got a checklist of things. You've either got to find corroborated or challenged 100% so you can replace it in one hit. That's not going to work. Because it will take a while to understand the text you're reading. It will take a while to recognize the patterns, a while to recognize the different story it's telling, a while to identify what it addresses and doesn't address Mm -hmm. in the faith point that you're starting from. So again, you have to give yourself permission for that length of process. So if you've got a voice in your head that says, don't rely on your own thinking, just believe everything the Lord tells you, which is the translation of a verse from the Proverbs, Mm -hmm. you've got to realize that's going to be a problem for you. And it's not about dishonoring God. It's about giving yourself the freedom to critique beliefs. And a a first step to doing that is to being able to separate your beliefs from your idea of God. I mean, I believe in God. I always have to clarify what I mean by that because it's a word that means different things to different people. And I feel very comfortable with that language and with my sense of connection. And I know that that is something different to my beliefs. Mm -hmm. My beliefs might help me to access that sense of connection with God, or they might not. But I have to realize they're not the same thing if I'm going to start critiquing my beliefs. Some people, their faith is like a Jenga tower where, you know, this piece of the puzzle depends on this, on this, on this, on this, on this. So if I pull out a piece at the bottom of the Jenga tower to look at it, the whole thing is going to tumble down. And I think before you can really start reframing belief, you have to be willing to see your faith differently as a whole number of Jenga pieces sitting on a table. (laughs) So you can pick one up at a time question it, consider it, put it that back down without that terror that everything is going to come tumbling down. Mm-hmm. So you've got to do a bit of self-reflection on where's your sense of security? How are your beliefs structured? Do you feel able to park certain beliefs over here and come back to them later to see if you still think they're correct or if they need finessing? You've got mm-hmm. to do that work prior Otherwise, when you go into the texts, you start trying to make comparisons before you've understood the text. You start trying to make corrections before you've got the big picture. And so I want to help people walk through that process, name those things, name that process for themselves. It's not hard. It's just something you've got to be very intentional about in order to really become a researcher. In, back in the day, when I was a very young boy, people talked about being seekers, and people understood what that meant. They were truth seekers, and they were looking for authenticity. They were looking for a real experience of life. And I, for my money, that's what a researcher is. Uh, it's a seeker. And being a seeker and having 101 conclusions you're never going to question are not the same thing. 
And I had to come to terms with myself, realizing that being a believer and a seeker are not the same thing. They can go together, but they don't always go together, especially if you come from one of those confessional churches. Mm. So, you know, it's a really internal, personal, pastoral process you have to go through to free yourself up. You know, one of the things I find, Paul, in a lot of these texts is, especially the religious texts, mostly, um, is when I start talking to people and they try to have a two-way conversation with me, they can't go too deep because it's based only on one book. So, for example, if I'm talking to somebody in Christianity, they have no knowledge outside of this one book. Even though this one book is a culmination of multiple ancient texts, scriptures and papyruses and verbal histories, everything else from around the world, this is a, uh, a cur heavily curated uh, book. And beyond that, they don't have any reference point. And so I think that hinders a lot of people, which is what you were just talking about. It hinders a lot of people from being, being able to see outside of that box and being able to drop some of the fears and the stress of thinking that they're doing something disrespectful to go look at some other material and information so that they can begin to discern it and see if it aligns with their current ideology, current information. Yes, uh, yes and, that's right. Yeah, that's important. I mean, I think a lot of people uh, in the churches have been taught to read the Bible in a bubble. But the Bible doesn't tell you to do that. No. And in fact, when you read uh, books in the Old Testament and the New Testament, very often the writers assume you've read other stuff that isn't in the Bible. So uh, if you read Genesis 6 or Jude, they all assume you've read the book of Enoch, which is not in the main canon of the Bible. It is in Ethiopia, but uh, nowhere mm -hmm. else. But they assume you've read that. Or uh, you read the Old Testament, they assume you've read all the annals of the kings, which are not all included in the Bible. And if you go to, for an example, if you go to the story of the birth of Isaac, you might puzzle over that if you're just reading the Bible all on its own. But as soon as you start reading world literature, if you read about the history of uh, Buddhism or the Yellow Emperor, or La Tzu, you'll realize that the birth of Isaac is part of a global family of stories that are very, very similar, and that that illuminates what the story of Isaac is about. It illuminates what the story of Abraham and Sarah is about. Mm -hmm. I think, again, people need to know the Bible doesn't tell the reader to read only this book. That's often what churches have said. And for yes. some Christians, it's a boast. Oh, the Bible is the only book I read. Well, that lovely, but the Bible hasn't told you to do that, and you'll have a richer understanding of it when you put it in its context. Sometimes mm -hmm. we need to read the Bible in a wider context in order to understand, oh, this is that kind of story. Oh, this is that kind of being. Oh, that's what was going on. And so that we'll use that case study because it really – then I think really does encourage people to start exploring more widely and get that bigger perspective. Yeah, absolutely. The technique that I utilize is not brunt force. When speaking with certain groups of people, I have the ability to drop small seeds, just small seeds, very small seeds, and put a little bit of water on them. And then you step back, you ease back, you give people some time to digest a small amount of thing, maybe send them on a mission to check one or two things out and you let them go and do that. Some will and some won't. You can't lead a horse to water and make it drink just because you're thirsty. So that's why I added that little extra piece at the end. You're thirsty. You know, let them become thirsty. Sometimes some of them will come back and you'll be able to have another two way conversation They'll begin to ask a few more questions. And that's the same way I think that you should treat family and friends and everyone else. If you come yes. at them too hard, you're going to just push them away. And it's going to turn into a battle and it's going to be tension in the room, awkward energy when holidays and certain thing, birthdays come around and nobody wants to be around each other. But if you do it in a very gentle and loving way where, you know, you wait for an opportunity that arises for you to inject a small amount of knowledge. I mean, really small. You'll see that they're 
you know, the people will begin to reflect on that information and it may trigger a question. And then that's like the beginning of the snowball rolling down the hill for me. And I answer that one question and I back away again. You see, I'm not, I'm not pushing too much. And then, you know, um, maybe a month or a week or two weeks later, maybe even right away, another question and another question. And then I see that they're opening up a little bit. Then I begin to elaborate a little bit more. But you can't even begin that process until you get the knowledge. Uh, Paul and I truly believe that in order to change the world, we need to educate people. We need more people like us duplicating what we are doing. I don't want to be the only person doing this. Paul doesn't want to be the only person doing it. There's 8 billion people on earth. How in the world are we going to reach all 8 billion people if we're doing all the work ourselves? We need more people that are passionate about this information, passionate about ancient history, what we, what we, what we can, would consider, I guess, as close to the truth as possible. Right. And to be able to then share that with as many people as possible in a very professional manner. And that's what this is all about, being able to teach you and give you the tools. There's a school called UCLA in America. They have an online digital library called the UCLA CDLI Online Cuneiform Digital Library. I think giving people the tools is a wonderful thing to do because that's when people can become confident for themselves that they've got their heads around a certain thing but confident to talk about it as well because you're right Billy we can reach uh, a world through the grassroots if people have this knowledge for themselves and and gossip it there's there's no breaks on that process of learning spreading throughout the community yeah but it has to be people who got the confidence to say well I've I've looked at the text this is what I've seen and that's totally different to someone saying, well, I think this because Billy said this and Paul said this. Your family is not going to be impressed with that. No. <laughs> or your friend, they're not going to be impressed with that. We might have convinced you. But as soon as you're saying, well, Billy says, Paul says, you kind of lost your purchase with the group you're talking to. But if you're saying, well, I've read the cuneiform texts and this is what I found and this is why I think they say this that commands a lot more respect. And I think also when you've made the journey for yourself, you've got a conviction when you speak about it that it that can be very winsome. But, yeah. Billy, I love what you just described about your approach to talking with people because I think you're absolutely right. You can't present people with, well, here are my five conclusions and this is why I'm right. It's far yeah. better to appeal to a person's curiosity and just yes. give them one little piece of the puzzle or did you know that mm -hmm. genesis one isn't a creation story it's a story of rehabilitating a devastated planet no oh well if you look in chapter one you you might pick that up here's that's a really intriguing thing for a lot of people who read the bible and if that's all they see when they go back they'll come back even more curious and what I am amazed by and delighted by is to find that people are naturally curious. So even if you've got somebody coming at you uh, really angry because they hold a different view uh, or they want you to agree with them and you would think, oh, gosh, here's a person who's never going to change what they think. The fact is they're still human and they're still curious. Curiosity is endemic to every human being. and there might just be one thing that'll capture their curiosity. Or in conversation with people, you might find they're curious about something you haven't studied and that you mm -hmm. don't know about. Encourage that, because I've found it doesn't matter what the white rabbit is. It doesn't matter which rabbit hole you go down. You will end up in the same great rabbit warren. Mm -hmm. And the best can do is to encourage a person wherever they are curious, even if it's only about the one thing. There's so much information uh, to share and to learn. And when you are speaking to someone and you tell them, I have looked at this text, I have broken down and analyzed the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation for myself you're gonna get a different kind of response from that person. First of all, 
You're saying it in first person. I, I did this. Not like you said, Billy and Paul and whoever else is out there. You say, I, now they know, whoa, this person's committed to this information. They've, they've utilized their own energy into putting some type of research into the information. That's going to perk up their ears a little bit. When you start naming tablets and texts and papyruses and cylinder scrolls, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. Wow. I got to listen a little bit because I didn't know that John or Jane was even into this kind of stuff at this, at that particular level. Hey, I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. And Paul, I'll talk to you very soon.